Our next speaker is Osprey Oriel Lake. She will be speaking on flaring forth in the Anthropocene. Osprey is the founder and executive director of the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network, known as WeCan International, working nationally and internationally with grassroots and indigenous leaders, policymakers, and a diverse coalitions to build women's leadership, climate justice, resilient communities, and a just transition to a decentralized, um, democratized, clean energy future. Osprey was the visionary behind the International Women's Earth and Climate Summit, which brought together 100 global women leaders to draft and implement the Women's Climate Action Agenda. She is honored to serve on the Executive Committee for the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature and has been a core organizer in various International Rights of Nature tribunals. She's the author of the award-winning book, Uprising for the Earth, Reconnecting Culture with Nature. Osprey. Osprey. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a real honor to be here. Um, those of you who know me, I've, it's been a long time since I've been uh, in a room like this in an academic atmosphere with philosophers and thinkers. I've been on the streets for the last years and uh, at the UN Climate Talks and a lot of other advocacy spaces. So thank you for inviting me and, and giving me some time to reflect. Um, it, it's been uh, a real honor to have a few moments to prepare for today. Um, I want to talk about what it means to me in this time of the Anthropocene to be arrested. So this is one version. I was arrested during the resistance movements at Standing Rock uh, to stop the Dakota Access Pipeline. And this uh, photo was taken at a solidarity action at the de um, Department of the Interior in Washington, D.C to really bring more attention to what was happening with the egregious indigenous and human rights violations that occurred during the actions um, in North Dakota. Um, and also to fight for the climate and the land and indigenous sovereignty because as we've been talking about today, there's a lot of intersection in our movements now. Um, part of the reason I did it is because we had, um, as an organization, spent time there uh, bringing different um, uh, supplies, standing on the front lines, but also uh, particularly since we are oriented around women, telling the stories of a lot of the indigenous women who are really the backbone of the movement. And everybody who, who was there will tell you how much the women were really the strength behind what happened in addition, in addition to the youth. So we did a big um, essay on the different women leaders, and it was a real honor to do that. I will also say in context to the conversations that's happened today, I also think it's a real question for all of us to think about the risks that we're taking because too often it is black and brown and indigenous bodies on the line. And I think it's something that we need to think about as we're talking about transforming our story and our narrative. Equally important, I have also been arrested for over 15 years by this tremendous ancient redwood tree that I spend time with every year and I would say is one of my greatest teachers. I share these two images with you to communicate the profound and epic time that we're living in, in which on the one hand, the dominant culture that, as we've been talking about, has really lost a deep connection with the natural world. We need to really be arrested by the magnificence and astonishing wisdom and beauty of the natural world, which we're trying to reclaim as a dominant culture. While well, on the other hand, we have to work ever harder to fight to protect the last wild spaces, ancient forests, rivers, oceans, and the frontline communities who are the first ones protecting and defending these lands. They are under attack. We know this. And it's really amazing to be thinking about the deep worldview, story, narrative, and philosophy that Thomas Berry uh, gave to all of us so that we wouldn't go further down a detrimental road. But here we are, and here we are, and what are we going to do? So on the one hand, I find myself wanting to spend time really working on this new narrative. At the same time, because we're an organization that works with frontline communities, 
there is such urgency in this moment to act. And how do we bring those things together? Because it's not just about acting, it's why are we acting? What is the analysis that we're coming from? The full title of my talk, which is fine, it couldn't fit into the program, so no, no critique there, was um, Flaring Forth in the Anthropocene. The subtitle, A Fierce, Passionate Impulse, impulse sorry, for Cosmovision and Social and Ecological Justice. And I want to begin by recalling the fourfold wisdom that has been described by Thomas Berry as the framework for advancing the human project for a sustainable future. Barry says, in these opening years of the 21st century, as the human community experiences a rather difficult situation in its relationship with the natural world, we might reflect upon a fourfold wisdom as a guide. And that is the wisdom of indigenous peoples, the wisdom of women, the wisdom of the classical traditions, and the wisdom of science. And these four wisdoms, I think, have a lot to do with how we can look at our Cosmo vision in this tumultuous era. Because of time, I'm just gonna focus on two of these wisdoms. One is on indigenous peoples and one on women, which are very close to my heart and the work that I do. But I'm also going to add in that we need to meet our urgency of this planetary condition, which I'm sure you're aware of due to everything that we can visually see, but also the recent UN IPCC report that came out at the end of the last year with basically you know, some of the most conservative scientists telling us we have 10 to 12 years left to change our trajectory. So I'm gonna add in also some comments about the global climate justice movement and the rights of nature movement. Thomas Berry and Brian, I learned his new name today, Swimy. I thought it was Brian Swim all this time. <laughs> Brian Swim um, powerfully described the original flaring forth in their beautiful book, The Universe Story, this giant, incredible impulse towards life. And I want to propose today, as we look at an existential crisis for humanity on the tail end of that long journey, that we need to have a new flaring forth. We need something as dynamic and powerful as that original flaring forth in the human species. Yet now, <laughs> thank you, yet now, as we face not only the sixth mass extinction and irreparable environmental harms, we really need to reflect upon the rising people's movements emerging in the Anthropocene, movements to save our species and stop devastating harm to the web of life. We need another flaring forth in the Anthropocene. So one of the ways this, this happened for me is in 2009, I started the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network, or WECAN, when I was walking in the redwood forests, it was right after one of the big climate negotiations um, in Copenhagen, you might remember, the Obama administration had come in, and there was really this sense of like, something's gonna happen, the governments are gonna move, there's transformation. And to make a long story short, basically the Copenhagen negotiations were a flop. I found myself walking in the redwoods saying, what am I going to do? Because I could just feel that things were so out of balance. I hadn't done any work for a long time in activism. I was doing my artwork, I was working on a book, and I just said I have to do something, and I had done a lot of research and saw that there was enormous connection between the role of women not only being impacted first and worse due to gender norms, unequal gender norms, um, and being harmed first by these impacts, but also that they were central to solutions, and that in fact you could not get to sustainability without them. And in fact, I would even say Part of the reason we're in the condition we're in is because of gender inequality. And if women had been speaking out and honored all these years, we would not be in this serious predicament. So, thank you. Um, so we based the organization on four pillars, the rights of women, the rights of indigenous people, the rights of nature, and the rights of future generations. And I'm just gonna quickly mention a few things about each of them because I think these are the voices that have been silenced and can bring us um, a way forward if we really empower all four of them. Um, I've said a little bit about women, but I um, just wanna tell a little story because there's so many I could tell you about the amazing things women are doing around the world. But 
coming out of the Standing Rock movement as one example, there was a, a need for that tremendous egregious violation to go somewhere. And there's still a lot of healing in those communities and a lot of work that needs to, to happen. Um, but one of the things that happened is I was approached by some of the indigenous women that I met when I was camped there. And together we put together an, a divestment campaign. And we've been bringing um, indigenous women from Standing Rock, from Line 3, the Bio Bridge pipeline, pipelines up in Canada, to go meet with the bankers face to face who funded these pipelines. And it's been such a powerful experience because there's nothing like face to face meetings, human to human contact. And it has moved me deeply to have these women sit with mostly white bankers in conference rooms and look them in the eye, mostly in Norway, Germany, and Switzerland where they've gone, and have them say, you know, we're human beings. We need water. Do you know what you you know, what you invested in and what it did to my community? I was thrown into a cage like a dog. We were strip searched and look them in the eye and say, you know, you are responsible for this. These are your policies. They have been hugely transformative conversations and we have gotten major divestments from banks, one of them being DNB Bank, a major bank in Norway who funded DAPL, $331 million. It's been a very powerful way to move forward. We have lots of work to do, but just to say, to me, this is part of this rise of these movements and speaking truth to power and changing our narrative as we've talked about. Um, I wanna briefly touch upon more of the spiritual aspects of women as well. I'm at two minutes. Whoa, where did the time go? Okay, um, I'm gonna skip a bunch of things. I wanna quote from Thomas Berry since this is about Thomas Berry. One of the things that I think is really amazing that he said is, um, in my book I talk about the Divine Mother and um, what has happened with the feminine principle and a lot of images around the world that have been destroyed due to the patriarchy of the feminine principle. And I really love something that Thomas Berry said. Um, we might now recover our sense of the maternal aspect of the universe in the symbol of the great mother, especially in the earth as the maternal principle out of which we are born and by which we are sustained. Once this symbol is recovered, the dominion of the patriarchal that has brought such aggressive attitudes into our activities will be mitigated. He says, if this is achieved, then our relationship with the natural world would undergo one of the most radical readjustments since the origins of our civilization in classical antiquity. One of the most radical readjustments is lifting up the image of the goddess mother, Thomas Berry, again, ahead of his time, seeing these relationships. So I wanted to bring that forward. And because I'm completely almost out of time, I'm just gonna uh, close with a quote. Um, there's so many things I could say about indigenous peoples very important to uplift them and their work right now and rights of nature. Um, today, as you might know, is uh, the youth climate movement all over the world is having a climate strike. And it's one of, you know, our principles is to support young people. And I wanna just highlight one of them because I think she's really a profound voice of this movement. Um, Greta Turnberg, some of you might know. She's been speaking out all over and has really sparked such an incredible movement of young people. Um, at the climate negotiations that were held in um, Poland at the end of last year, this is what she said to governments. We need to keep the fossil fuels in the ground and we need to focus on equity. I mean, look at that. So she got it right away that this has to be done in a manner with social justice at its heart and if solutions within the system are so impossible to find, maybe we should change the system itself. We have not come here to beg world leaders to care. You have ignored us in the past and you will ignore us again. We have come here to let you know that change is coming, whether you like it or not. The real power belongs to the people. So to honor the youth, I just wanted to conclude with that. Thank you.